Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Please stop now. Those were the words of the United States President Joe Biden to American journalist Thomas Friedman just 48 hours ago in a special meeting meant to send a clear message to the people in Israel in light of the last moves by the coalition towards a judicial overhaul. President Biden summoned Friedman to the Oval Office in order to send a clear message asking Netanyahu to stop trying to rush through his judicial overhaul and build a broad consensus first. Biden stated that if Netanyahu indeed continues with the overhaul, he will break, quote, something with Israel's democracy and with the relationship with America's democracy, and he may never be able to get it back, end of quote. This unprecedented message men, made by the president and brought by Friedman to the editorial of the New York Times was delivered in the midst of a presidential visit paid by Israeli President Yitzhak Herzog in the White House and before uh, his historical speech yesterday in the U.S. Congress. The article was published also after and maybe in direct relation to a telephone call between Biden and Netanyahu earlier this week. Ladies and gentlemen, as you all see, um, important developments are occurring by the hour. Um, as last night, the proposal of a bill which is set to bring to the cancellation of the reasonableness clause was approved by the Constitution Committee in the Israeli Knesset. The next and final step will be the second and third readings of the bill in the Assembly with the aim to bring it to its final approval ne early next week. This move, according to the opposer's view, marks the first brick in the wall of dictatorship, ending, as they say, the democratic era of the state of Israel. Much on the agenda today as we dedicate today's program to discuss these current developments, as well as the mass demonstrations of Israelis rejecting this process, focusing also on latest calls from Israeli Air Force reservists and reservists from other IDF units as well to stop their volunteering for duty in case the judicial overhaul passes. Where is Israel headed and how will U.S.-Israeli relations be formed? INSS English Podcast. We begin right after this. Hello, everyone. I'm Adi Kanto, and joining me in the desk today are Brigadier General Reserved, Dr. Meir Elran, Senior Researcher and Director of the Domestic Research Cluster of the INSS. Next to him, um, Colonel Reserve Advocate Pnina Sharvit Baruch, Senior Researcher in the Institute and Head of the Program of Law and National Security, and um, Dr. Chuck Freilich, a senior researcher as well at the INSS and former Deputy National Security Advisor in the Israel's National Security Council. Thank you all very much for joining me today. Thank in the you. Talk. Thank you. So as I said, much on the agenda and uh, very little time to maybe discuss all of the points, but we will try to discuss the main ones and important ones. And I'll, uh, I would like to start with you, Mayor and Pnina. Um, referring to the domestic aspects. Uh, first, we'll start with the domestics and then we'll take off to more the Israeli-American relations, but first with Israel. Mayor, what is your view on current developments in Israel at the moment? A lot has happened in the past week, but I know that you would like to also to take us more to the overall, to the overview of what, is, what we're witnessing, not just last week, but... What's, what's happening and what will be? Okay, so that's really true. I'd like very much to broaden the spectrum to an extent that we understand what we're talking about. So we have a convergence here of uh, many processes that have been going on in Israel for quite a long time. We are in the midst of an unprecedented, very, very severe social and political crisis that takes a, uh, already uh, more than six months and there is no end in sight to this uh, very, very uh, profound, I would say, a, uh, happening. Uh, I want to stress that this is unprecedented, very, very severe, and it puts in Israel into jeopardy mm -hmm. as far as its future, its form, its identity, and its character. We have the government on one hand, and we have the protesters on the other hand. We have two very, very strong and to a large extent quite surprising phenomena here that are converging and clashing in a way that never happened in Israel before. Mm 
to the extent that it really threatens to shatter Israel's democracy in the future. So the government came up with this a, a judicial initiative, which was, I must say, quite a surprise to people who were looking at the political scene in Israel. January 4th, they came up with this a, a very bold a, a initiative. And I understand it as an initiative created and put forth in order to change the balance that has been going on in Israel for such a long time, basically since its inception, 75 years ago, mm -hmm. the balance between the different branches of government, mostly by diminishing the capacities, the position, and the responsibilities of the Supreme Court as a major controlling body over the executive and the legislation. And this initiative was apparently designed really to change the very basic structure of the Israeli government system. The DNA. The DNA, exactly. On the other hand, we have another new phenomenon. This is the public protest. I think that we have to understand that we have here a very massive, deep-rooted public protest that goes on and on, growing in size, in seriousness, and in the engagement of very, very important sectors within the Israeli public, including... The elites, I must say, pilots in the Air Force, in the IDF Air Force, high-tech people, leaders of the industry, leaders of the business community, leaders of the uh, right, of the uh, uh, law communities, leaders of the academia, and people at large that are trying to hold this kind of a, uh, of a uh, projection on the part of the government. So presently, we have a situation in which this clash has emerged to be very, very serious, very, very dramatic. And I think that it's important for us to understand that the very existence of this kind of a crisis, as I said before, unprecedented, threatens the basic, the basic pillars of the Israeli system in general the social system, the political system, the economic system, and also the security system. And we have to understand the, ser the, the severity of this situation. And if we don't attend, if the government does not attend right now to this particular problem, the severity of the crisis in a way that it will be attended seriously by the government, this is the responsibility the main responsibility of the government. You mean the, the head of the government or the coalition? The, go the coalition, the voices. government, the cabinet, and of course the prime minister. All of them have a joint responsibility, and of course the responsibility of the prime minister is primary in this respect. So this is really the problem that we are facing right now. Whether we will keep on talking about this clause or that clause, okay, Instead of facing the reality and trying to solve the real problem of the very serious crisis that we are facing, uh, faced with, then we will really lose track and we will be in a, situa in a very, very dire situation. And this is my basic proposition here. Mm -hmm. Nina, are we already there? Are we already facing... The, the brick, the first brick in the wall of dictatorship? And do you see any difference between where we were three months ago and today? Well, first of all, I think one of the main problems is there's total lack of trust today. Um, there's no trust in the government by vast majority of the Israeli public. There's no trust also between the different parts of the public, which is also an issue because uh, Mayer gave a very good presentation of of the, these ideas that threaten democracy and this reaction to this threat. But then what happened is that this came, sat on top of rifts that have been there for a long time in the Israeli society and, and, the, the, and the lid burst open and everything 
Pulled because Mayer said it was a surprise. Out. How much was it a surprise? Um, well, the, the, I think the surprise was that they tried to do everything. Yariv Levin, our Minister of Justice, has been talking about this plan forever. So anybody who listened to him maybe wasn't surprised. But the surprise was that the Prime Minister let him go ahead with such a, a, a huge a, a, a change and broad and dramatic change in one go. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe today uh, they think they should have done it. But now the problem is that the government said, OK, so we're not doing that. We will only do one thing at a time. Or we'll only do one thing. And the protesters, again, there's no trust, say, okay, but even if we agree to the one thing, eh, you know, they say this is a salami approach. This is, the, yes. this is the first one. So unreasonableness, which is the one that was maybe the least controversial. And again, there's a question of what enters there. But this is now viewed not as really... ending there mm-hmm. but as one step and then the next step and then all the time the examples are brought from Poland for example where also mm-hmm. the government did it in steps and eventually uh, and uh, and they were also protests and they stopped protesting when they stopped protesting the government did more and exactly. and lost their or, or losing their democratic the image. as well but I think to, to, to go back to the rifts I think <clears throat> What we see here is broader than just a threat to the democratic establishment, to the, to the, the balance of powers, which is, of course, very important, because the question is, why is the government pursuing all this power? And here it comes to what values this government presents and what policies this government is presenting. A, a, a trying to implement yeah. why and, and why now and also, and why timing. now because first of all this coalition is the most right-wing coalition we ever had in Israel it will, mm. we always had coalitions even for the last uh, 15 years 20 years we've been controlled by right uh, by the Likud mm-hmm. but but there were always other elements in the government were that were more moderate now there's no the Likud yes. is uh, Netanyahu is the most uh, moderate uh, in the government and also the ones that have a, a very strong ideology. and a nationalistic ideology, mm-hmm. a religious ideology, they are also very, they are very driven and they have plans. And the Likud, the members of the other uh, members of the Likud, there's, there are some also with uh, going against the elite and the rest you don't really hear. So, so the government is controlled. The ones that have the power are the extreme elements. And what we see here is policies of, in three dimensions, of strengthening religion and And the interference of religion in everyday lives in the public sphere, for example, as a woman, I'm wearing red, not wearing it accidentally mm-hmm. because this is the, the color of the protests of women because we see more and more religious and conservative uh, ideas of getting p- pulling back gender equality in Israel. Mm-hmm. more limitation no we there are almost no women very few ministers n- only two uh, uh, out of 31 ministries are uh, have general managers who are women what are um, the implications of this if, you, if we so, take so this I'm as an example so, so, the, they, the, so the fear is women. for example as uh, with yeah. women that, that the idea of taking down the unreasonableness and I think more broadly mm-hmm. the rule of law mm-hmm. and the courts as those putting uh, uh, you know Borders. blocking the government yeah. from yeah. doing things that, uh, that hinder human rights and equality uh, will affect first of all the weaker communities uh, those that are not uh, uh, those that whose rights uh, the, these religious and And extreme and conservative elements that are very strong in the government mm-hmm. don't like so it's the LGBT yeah. let's start by them but the women too and we already see trends and these also are, Arab already, Israelis live here yes course, and the minorities and mm-hmm. the Arab Israelis and the Palestinians because mm-hmm. a lot of it is from the for the nationalistic parties what they really care about is getting a hold on all of the West Bank and pushing the Palestinians and taking away their rights mm-hmm. because the courts were the ones protecting their rights too so So what we see here is not only the question of whether the democratic institutions will prevail but what will be the the what will be the values of the state of Israel will we continue to have democratic and liberal values or will we become a very nationalist nationalistic and religious country and when that happens uh, when we look at countries where they are nationalistic and religious and conservative powers mm-hmm. uh, for example women who Don't do very well so it becomes an existential least, threat yeah. mm-hmm. women are feeling existen- an existential threat to, to our to our equality to our rights uh, that's why the people are in the streets it's not just this close or that close of course I understand do you see by the way any chance of somehow coming to to uh, um, compromise in the last hours just before passing the bill? I think many people want a compromise. I think what what we're talking about this rift, it's tearing up not only society at large, it's tearing up families. 
friendships from, from high school are breaking up, uh, divorce, people not speaking to their brothers and sisters. Um, so, so I think there is a lot of people that really want this to stop, want us to stop calm talking down. to each other, mm. calm down, stop hating each other. The, 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 the level of animosity, hatred mm. and, and is, is really, on a yeah. personal level, is huge. So I think people would really want that. The problem is, again, that it's difficult to trust Netanyahu because so many times he's made promises and broken them. Um, so some say no compromise should be done. I personally think we need to get a compromise. I think we need to hear everybody. I think that Israelis that don't necessarily share my position still love the country and still don't want to take away all my rights. It's the fringes, but the fringes, the extreme voices, those are the ones that are heard These at the moment. These are the, the voices that Let we hear. Let me say hear. something about sure. what you asked, uh, about you know, looking at the future. First of all, I think that uh, there is no way out Out of it we need to talk we need to have a dialogue we have to, to have a substantial dialogue and we have to base this dialogue on compromise I think that there is no other way to uh, advance here the problem is number one as Tina said so uh, correctly uh, we are now in the midst of a very emotional kind mm-hmm. of a clash crisis mm-hmm. uh, And uh, it is very, very difficult to come uh, with the, uh, you know, with initiatives that will really bring about this kind of a and dialogue. And this in three days. The, It'll have to be well, seen. I There am, will be a last-minute miracle. I must tell you, I must tell you that even though I think that what is happening in these days and what is going to happen in Knesset, in the Knesset, as far as this particular clause is concerned, is very, very important, it is... Even if it passes, and I hope it doesn't pass, mm-hmm. I don't know exactly how, this will not be the end. For sure. Because the government will, will probably push forward its initiative, or its positive initiatives, and people will be against it. And the uh, crisis will actually evolve and uh, go, go along. Yeah. So we still need to think about ways for us to, you know, start this kind of, some kind of a dialogue. We had a dialogue. Which was not very it very failed. fruitful with mm-hmm. the uh, with, under the auspices of the of the president of president Herzog and uh, but I must tell you that I think that despite of the uh, the uh, tension between the two blocks it is the responsibility of the government to make this dialogue happen and Okay. They have to understand that they cannot master their majority in the Knesset, okay? 64. In order to make such, you know, dramatic changes in the system. Without a consensus. Without a broad consensus. Yeah. So I understand, as far as I understand it, this is basically the, the, the commitment of the, of the government to establish new procedures for, Of dialogue right now it's a uh, I mean supposedly it's political but it's also social in terms of the uh, uh, the tension and the in the conflict between the two sides and we do not have processes or procedures that will bring about a uh, reasonable kind of a uh, and, and successful kind of a uh, Of a dialogue. Of dialogue. And so that's, that's our problem. First of all, to establish the channels of communications that will be able to bring about some kind of understanding, compromise and agreement between the sides. Yeah. It will probably take a long period of time. The question if, time, is if we have this time. This that's a very good um, question. And you know, yeah. as, as, as far as I can see it, it time mm. is running out in terms of what's happening. I just want to add something. Yeah, just before you, moving to China. Yeah. Uh, to characterize what's happening here despite of the high tension luckily and miraculously so far the clash between the two blocks or camps is not violent is not violent mm-hmm. it could have been much worse it could have been much worse and it's so far it's not we are still on the brink of Of such things happening I hope and pray that it doesn't happen because if once it does happen then talk about you know a uh, dialogue and compromise will not be as uh, possible as we hope it mm-hmm. is right now so this is something that on one hand we need to cherish that we are not there 
But if we will be there, then it's going to be a major yeah, problem. I fully for agree, us. but we do hear of attempts by certain people to sometimes run over people during the demonstration yes, or spill this something is over just, their face. This is just this occasional, well. marginal, <clears throat> very marginal, and let's not, not, let's not mm-hmm. uh, disregard the big picture. The big okay. picture is still very, very, uh, you know. Uh, reasonable let's, let's put it this way it despite this way. of the fact that you have to remember the discourse is very very violent is very violent so the potential of physical violence is there for sure and we have to understand and we have to uh, see what happens so that it doesn't really if someone place. sits at home and takes uh, yeah. and hands. also by yeah. the way we have to say one uh, positive word also last about sentence the, and then I'm moving to about Jeff. about the police I mean they are handling mm-hmm. the protest again quite reasonably not a 100%, but you know what? More than 95% of the instances are being handled in a pragmatic, reasonable manner by the police. Yes. We have excellent civil servants, and, and that's, that's a very important thing. That's the one of the fears. The question is if it remains if the remain, situation. Yeah. Bef- like before to, we turn to the yeah, US yeah, issue, like to, I, I want to re- add one comment yeah. to what was said here. Please. First of all, I could not agree more with mm-hmm. Mayor and uh, Penina about the severity of the issue. I think this is... By far the worst domestic crisis that we've ever faced with profound ramifications for our national security. I disagree with them at least partly on the area of the need for compromise. Mm-hmm. Now I say that as someone who, for whom compromise is my fundamental approach to life, and I believe that it is the lifeblood of democracy. So I am typically the guy who is always advocating for compromise and moderation. Mm-hmm. I think here we are at a Cul- we're at the culmination, we are at a turning point in Israeli history that has been building, as uh, Penina was saying, for decades. And then there was this new issue of the judicial reform, or I call it the judicial wrecking ball, which was added. And now the question is whether we continue the salami tactics of diminishment of uh, civil rights in Israel. Slowly, slowly. Uh, slowly, slowly, that we've mm. seen in recent decades. And the religious establishment gaining more power, the right gaining more power. If we continue the so long... The extreme right, I would the say. The extreme yeah. right, I would, racist yeah. and fascist yeah. right. Uh, if we continue the process of salami and don't take advantage of this unique moment, then we'll get to end with... There's going to be nothing left. And if you, we're going to lose in any event if we go that way. Then what we see is just the beginning. You and, say. What, mm-hmm. and what I believe we have to do now, the, the liberal wing of Israeli society has awoken in a way that we've never seen. They say it themselves. We have awoken. Yeah. This is a unique moment in, in our history. This is the Bastille, if you wish. Mm-hmm. And we have to fight to win now. Uh, if the other side is really willing to engage in substantive dialogue, I'm always for it. I haven't seen it this yet. Is the way, I, I, this I is exactly int- what the other side says, in, but yeah, by the way. I want to intervene here to suggest the following. I mean, if we talk about, I mean, this is my contrarian position to Chuck's. Excuse me for that. That's always liberal. When we, that's fine. It's okay. Yeah. We're a liberal democratic constituent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I recognize your right to be liberal. I respect <laughs> yours as well. Listen, if we talk in terms of winning and losing, okay, then, uh, uh, then we have a problem. Hmm. We have to remember that the government and the coalition has a majority in the, uh, in the, in the Knesset. They, their capacity to win is much uh, stronger than the one of the public or the protesters. You have to understand that what's happening in the protest movement is really miraculous. The energies are yeah. just tremendous. 28 tremendous. weeks. And 20, today 20, they're 20, all walking, on, walking uh, to Jerusalem. Exactly. Right Jerusalem. Right we are yeah. talking Thousands about a very large crowd that is very engaged, In very 45 active. degrees heat. Exactly, yeah, exactly. But still, we have to understand that this is not a fair play game kind of a game, okay? Yeah. Uh, they can, the protesters can impact the government together with something that we're going to talk about We uh, can shut down the country and hopefully we yeah, can but force still, a change they, in the coalition. Well, yeah, well, but the public isn't going to change. The, and, uh, the problem is... There's that, still I mean, the day after. You have to remember, yes. there are and we certain... we have to live together. There are certain factions with the, or groups within the protest movement that have sort of a, the edge mm-hmm. capacity to make a difference. But they, I hope, will be very, very hesitant and very cautious about that. I'm talking mainly about the military, 
mostly about the reservists. The they have the capacity to do that, but the dilemma here is just yeah. heartbreaking. Very, very difficult. And uh, I see them These hesitating. These are patriots who absolutely, are signing now letters of... Absolutely, absolutely. And because they are patriots, I think that they can, I, and I respect very much their attitude, their approach to that. For sure. They're not rushing to do dramatic, you know, radical things. Mm -hmm. They are not anarchists. They are very reasonable people. So let me put it this way. The government is stronger, potentially, with its majority in Knesset. The public... Okay, can impact what's happening very much so, and we have seen so far that they did, together with, of course, other elements that impact the situation. And we'll talk momentarily about what's happening with the United States. We're just about to okay? do this, yeah. Okay, exactly. But let's not be in a position that we will force ourselves into a position that clashes are inevitable. It's not I a win-lose situation. I think exactly. what we need uh, is, is confidence-building measures. Yes, I've, I'm a veteran of years and years of negotiations with the Palestinians, but it, it, some things resemble here because, first of all, really the, the distrust, lack trust. the lack of trust, but the fact that also they are not going anywhere, and here I'm talking internally, Israel. Mm -hmm. Both sides are not going anywhere. They're also waking some, up to the same people some tomorrow. Some people say that yeah. they're going very to leave true. the country, and very that's true. a very bad alternative. Yes, We don't want to leave Clear. the country. Um, and so we have, to, we have to live together. We have to make... certain compromises as long as it's not compromise. I wouldn't compromise my quality as a woman. Exactly. That's my red line, for example, and there are other red lines. Okay, but um, make compromise, but listen to each other. And I think what we need is confidence building measures. Here, I would expect the, the prime minister, the first and easy step he could do is just some go out in a, and speak very clearly against all the vicious uh, rhetoric. against the uh, a, a, a say that he believes that everybody is part of the Israeli society. It's the prime minister of everybody. Call for people to listen to each other. Show some kind of empathy to the demonstrators and go against this really terrible, you know, one of the ministers talking about the attorney general as a threat to, the biggest threat to the country. It's a national security terrorist. threat. I mean, yeah. you have to hear the prime minister say that these kinds of expressions are not acceptable. Yeah. Let's start with that. It's, a little, it's, a, little step, it's yeah. a little step in trying to bring down the flames of what we see in society. Yeah. And we don't hear the prime minister. I'm almost wondering if he's in his full capacity. Because There I can't understand be, where yeah. Benjamin Netanyahu that I knew once that cared about the country, where he has vanished to. There are voices in the government and in the Knesset that are, it's their, in their interest to have the flames. And this is, yes, I think, but I don't think it's the problem even bigger. bigger. Including the I'd prime like minister, to, whose, I think, primary motivation of this and told, to the have entire the business has to do with his own legal and, uh, and difficulties. And that's what he wants to be remembered in history for? No, that's, it's that's not what he wants question. to, but he doesn't want to, he doesn't want <laughs> yeah. to be convicted, which he may. We, uh, we, uh, no, we now end the first the part of this, uh, of this talk, this very important talk, the, uh, discussing the domestic aspects of the current crisis, the biggest crisis that we've ever, we've ever uh, experienced in Israel. We are now taking off uh, uh, to our greatest friend, the U.S., the United States, and really to ask what is the effect on Israeli Israel? American, really, U.S.-Israeli relations, special relations, we need to say. Um, how, are, how are these relations influenced by, by what is happening currently in Israel? So, Chuck, I'd like to ask you, uh, um, and maybe start first with, with the article, the article of, of Thomas Friedman, the, the journalist that was published, the first one that he published uh, earlier this week. He uh, titled the article as follows, The U.S. Reassessment of Netanyahu's Government Has Begun. And I'm quoting, Biden team sees the far-right Israeli government led by Benjamin Netanyahu engaged in unprecedented radical behavior under the clock of uh, judicial reform, in quotation. These processes are undermining U.S. shared interests with Israel, U.S. shared values, and the vitality important shared fiction. And that's what I'd like to ask you about. Uh, about the status of the West Bank that has kept peace hopes that are barely alive. Um, so Thomas Friedman wrote two very important articles this week, and I'd like to hear your view, your stand on what uh, he mentioned in, in, in this article. Do you think the internal developments in Israel, how do you think they, in, that the developments in Israel shape the current discourse in the American society, um, current views? What is, what is he talking about, the, 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 this fiction, shared fiction between U.S. and Israel? Okay, I think that... Uh... There are two important triangles 
one in U.S.-Israeli relations and one in American Middle East policy that are deeply affected by what's happening today in Israel. And they get back to what Friedman was saying. The triangle in Israeli history or in U.S.-Israeli relations is the fundamental normative values that we share of democracies, liberal democracies. Secondly, Israel's strategic importance for Israel and its much lower in terms of its relative weight. And thirdly, the influence of the Israeli, pro-Israeli lobby. Mm -hmm. The normative values, the shared values, are the basis for the other two parts of this triangle. If you look at U.S. Mideast policy from around the Yom Kippur War or a couple of years later until around 2010, one couldn't see anything happening in the Middle East without an American footprint. Mm. The U.S. is involved in everything. It was in most areas, there were many areas, the driving force. This is the era, era in which the U.S. built a moderate pro-Western Arab camp. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's the era in which it contained the so-called Arab rogues, initially Lib uh, Syria, then Libya, then Iraq, Iran. And thirdly, this is the era in which it built the special relations with Israel. How does that fit with building a pro-Western camp and containing the radicals? What did it is the very glue that Friedman speaks about. I've used this term for decades. Mm -hmm. It was the peace process, the belief that the U.S. and Israel were working towards a resolution of the Palestinian issue. A common issue. goal. A, a common <laughs> goal, but it was first of all the, the, the uh, peace with the Egyptians and the Jordanians, mm -hmm. and then we had peace with the Abraham Accord states. But it was the idea that Israel is committed to a two-state solution together with the U.S., and that brought the Arabs along as well. Both of these things are threatened. Now, the shared values really are the base for this. For the first time, we've had disagreements with the U.S. Uh, umpteen times over the years, and some of them have been quite significant. Settlements, for example. It's Particularly ongoing. the settlements. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is fundamentally different this time is that it's not about issue X or issue Y. It is an American concern that Israel's fundamental character as a democracy is changing. And if that happens, then it undermines the shared values part of the triangle, and it undermines Israel's strategic importance, because we won't have very much strategic importance if we're not a democracy, and it will greatly undermine the image of the and the strength of the pro-Israel lobby, because the fundamental basis for what they say in Congress and everywhere else is Israel is the one shining democracy in the Middle East. And if Israel ceases to be a, demo a democracy, this cancels the, the strategic relations, is how you see it? The strategic it doesn't, it doesn't um, cancel. horizon between, or, it, or it, strategy stays, but without no, the no, shared values. No, no, it greatly undermines it. Look, the U.S. has relations with uh, strategic relations exactly. with numerous non-democratic states. Mm -hmm. Their ties with democratic states are far stronger. They aren't transient. What we see today, the crisis in U.S.-Saudi relations, or the crisis is maybe too yeah. strong a word, but the, Tension. the tensions in the relations between U.S.-Turkish relations are because there's no normative basis. Mm -hmm. for, okay, so things go along. Uh, the Saudis feel that they are being abandoned, and they could be. We always said that Israel can't be abandoned because of the shared values. Mm -hmm. You don't, the United States doesn't abandon democracies. So this is a totally different crisis from the ones that we've had in the past. We have to also remember that Please. the U.S. accepts uh, the strategic importance uh, as a security envelope and, and uh, economic ties. It's also the, 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 the finger that puts up, that, that, that vetoes the decisions against us in the exactly. Security Council. And Israel is the one that is on the U.N. agenda more than all the other Middle Eastern countries. Uh, we have already uh, a court in the, uh, in the International Criminal mm -hmm. uh, Court. There's already an investigation in the yeah, International Court of Justice. Yeah. There's a there's a, a advisory opinion on the illegality of occupation. We need um, the um, we need the U.S. on our side in all this diplomatic front, and the way we get the the Americans and also other allies in in the Western countries to support us is because we are a democracy, and then they can say, look. Israel is a democracy, mm -hmm. you can't single it out, we need to protect it, we need to, to veto decisions against it. When we don't have that, then we will have a much, much more I difficult time. The question is whether well, Israel is remains a democracy, but like Hungary, for example, an well, unliberal democracy. Let me, you let can me, still let remain let a democracy, me, but... Let me allude to that. And the EU, the and the EU is sanctioning DNA, Hungary, Just by the one way. second. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just want to make one thing very, very clear. Israel is in a very, very unique 
situation, geopolitical situation, compared with any other country in the world. Okay? Since our inception, even before that, for 75 years, we are facing very, very severe challenges, mm -hmm. security challenges. Existential challenges, eh? Yes. No? Maybe that's too, I, too exaggerated for you? Let's not get your... into that. Very, very mm -hmm. serious challenges mm -hmm. on the security domain, okay? Very, very serious. Unlike Turkey, with all due respect, Hungary, uh, Poland, and other countries. Very, very serious. People make these comparisons now. And, no? yeah, people yeah, do, yeah. but I think that there is no comparison. Mm -hmm. We are a very small country, surrounded with our, by our en enemies, and we are constantly threatened in many, many fronts, in different ways. Now more our, than ever, maybe. Yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, but still today, mm -hmm. okay, to a large extent, and unfortunately also in the future. Our nece necessity to rely on a superpower is basic trait, a pillar yeah. in our national security. Yeah. In the doctrine, in the concept, and also in the structure itself. Yeah, we cannot okay? allow ourselves and not to have it. we cannot, mm -hmm. exactly, we cannot sustain our position in many other ways, you know, cultural ways, arts, okay, science, technology, etc. Technology et is part of our security. Too. Very, very, <laughs> very important. But I'm when sure it comes to security, it's crucial. This is our, our reliance on the United States to be willing Okay, to support us, or to provide with us the means to sustain our status in terms of our national security is something that is very, very central. And we cannot lose that. Yes. We cannot even diminish that in any way. For sure. And it, this it, is yeah. something that we have to remember. Just a minute. Okay, we have to remember. This is one of the most important strategic Interests Interest. of the state of Israel. In this studio, there is a very clear consensus regarding this. The question is what happens when we leave the studio and go to the street? Is it clear for the average Israeli citizen think, how important these relations are? I think it is clear. I think it is clear to most Israelis. Mm -hmm. It's not, but there is always the balance. What is more important? And there is a very, very deep controversy about that presently especially with some people even in the government that uh, sort of, you know, refuse to accept this very, very basic truth that we were talking about. I, okay? yeah, so yeah. this is really a problem. That's why when, when, when President Biden was talking about the far-right groups with, yeah. within, within the government, he was talking about people who do not understand what is the meaning, what is the democracy. core issues of democracy on one hand and our relations with the United States on the other. They simply Clearly. don't understand or they disregard it. I don't, I can't really interpret that. But yeah. the, the, we have a problem here. We have a problem. This is for sure. The, and, you know, yeah. and the prime minister, if you ask me, he is the first one to understand the you know, this, the, the, the importance, the importance of this of issue. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I want to, to ask uh, just a minute, Chuck, I'd like to, I'd like, uh, of course, uh, to let you to hear your view. And uh, I, I would add to my question, if you see any correspondence between the current crisis in the Israeli society, the polarization in the society, and the parallel polarization also in the American society. Do they interact somehow with one another? Well, I don't know if they interact, but I think or it's, it, it, it's, or... it's remarkable, the, the similarity. I okay. mean, if you change some names, it's almost the same story. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to talk about the points that Mayor was making, but I at least have a small disagreement with him. I don't, okay. think, the, I don't think the Israeli public, uh, I don't think Israeli decision makers anymore uh, fully appreciate the existential I don't like to use the word existential okay we, we overuse it in Israel far too much mm -hmm. the existential importance of the relationship with the United States there is a question to my understanding whether we can even exist today without the United States the dependence is so great now I don't know the answer maybe in extreme circumstances or desperate circumstances you come up with desperate solutions there is no doubt that it is an infinitely weaker and an infinitely poorer existence, one that no one from left to right in Israel wants to live with. Mm -hmm. The dependence on the U.S. is so overwhelming. People to go to the 3.8 billion that we receive, that's the least of it. If we had to, we could live without it. It's not that bad. The government is spending billions on 
unnecessary things today. The real dependence is the the quality of the weaponry. Theoretically, yeah. we could buy from someone else if they were willing to sell. It's the quality of American weapons, the F-35. It's the joint training. It's intelligence cooperation. It's cyber cooperation. It's joint strategic planning for every potential contingency in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. In some cases, operational planning. Okay, It's how we deal with the Iranian nuclear chain. We don't completely agree on that. But there's no other country out there willing to really work with us on that. It's the U.S. helping us promote peace in the region. We can disagree what kind of peace, but everybody would like peace. It's regional normalization. It's international normalization. And one of the things Patina mentioned that people really are unaware of is the critical, overwhelming importance of the U.S. veto in the Security yeah, Council. Sure. The, the state of Israel would have been the subject of international sanctions for decades had it not been for the and U.S. Soldiers veto, and officers. including... Yeah. including Certain strategic capabilities that we are thought by I the world. Just can, can I just last, like, of course, just the one we'll question. This reassessment that Thomas Friedman refers to in his article does it really mean reassessing also the military cooperation or more on the the shared values? I think he made Look, a distinction he here. He did. Uh, he did. Look, first well, of all, I don't think he meant, and of course, the certain parts of the political spectrum. Uh, took off on this. He didn't meant, mean to say that there was already a formal reassessment underway. Yeah, if you do what this he, and this, then we what he was don't trying to you. say What he was trying to say is that there's a crisis emerging in the relationship. Okay. And Israel's activities will force the U.S. into a reassessment if we don't change course. And that's why then, after the president made his various statements, they came to the conclusion that actually the message wasn't received in Israel. And so he calls in mm. Friedman for another... That was the reason an, he summoned him to the for Oval a, Office. For an hour and a quarter interview yes. just about the relationship with one of the United States' foremost allies. And the allies. message was to the Israeli people, not the leaders. Well, I think it was also to or the leaders. Just the leaders. Stop, stop. stop. I just it's, want to say can something. Can I say something? Yes, yes of um, course, Pinas, and, and then my... Okay, absolutely. All of you okay. have permission to say. <laughs> okay, thank you. But I, I think that uh, because Chuck said that everybody understands from the left and the right the importance or should understand or, sure. or, uh, or at least a... a would, under, would agree that it's very important to, to have this relationship because of uh, uh, our reliance on the U.S. But mm -hmm. I think that in the extreme right, um, I would even say that there uh, is an interest to weaken the relationship between the U.S. and Israel because, uh, again, there are those that have uh, one track mind, I would say, that they have one agenda, and that well, I'm talking ideology. about the nationalistic right, yeah. is the issue of the whole of uh, greater Israel, Judea and Samaria, no Palestinian uh, compromise with the Palestinians. And here, one of the, one of the obstacles mm -hmm. in achieving these goals, one of them is the courts, Okay, so we're trying to, and the legal advisors, we have to weaken them. But another big one is the U.S. Yeah, yeah. So I think that that's... And the West, and when that, I would say, yeah. Yes, but mainly the U.S. Yeah. We, we don't listen so much Europe. to Europe. Yes, mm. but Europe doesn't have such an impact on the Israeli government. You're right. So the point mm. is that from that, when that's your main goal, when everything else is 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 is, uh, is just a, a tool to reach this do goal the you the All relations are possible <laughs> no the relations with the us are a problem not an or not, not, an, not asset. an asset they're not an asset mm -hmm. they're not they're an obstacle there and that and that's why i think that they they, they might even be doing things intentionally to jeopardize this, this relationship very very I agree troubling with that very is troubling let me add the situation let me add, yes, add, wanted to add another <laughs> yeah. to me very very major significant element in the connection between Israel and the United States, and this is the Jewish community in the United States, okay? Remember, there are two big Jewish communities in the world, in Israel and the United States. And I think that what happens in Israel is a major interest for the Jews in America, and what's happening to the Americans in to the Jews in America is a major interest for the state of Israel. And mm -hmm. we have to think not only about what's happening in the White House, mm -hmm. very, very important, what's happening in the Congress, also very important, what's happening in the press, but also what is happening with the Jewish community. Inside the communities. Mm -hmm. In the Jewish community over there. And unfortunately, things are happening within this very, very vibrant community very successful, very important community. Things are happening 
gradually not necessary in our favor in Israel's they're favor. distancing more and more and they are distancing okay. from us and this is another reason for us to be aware of the risks of what's happening here to the perception of the Jews in America as to what is the nature and the vision the democratic vision of the state of Israel and uh, we have to think about that mm-hmm. and this is something again that we do not think about enough about and I think that we should and again the government has a major role in doing that I, we, I, I want to add one more we can uh, just a short comment and then I'd like to, all of you three of you to close me we, we are just about to close this discussion and um, with uh, just give you a leading question what should Israel do today 20th of July in order to stop this escalation what what should be done Chuck start with so, you so I will make both of my comments at the same time because they're linked. Approximately two months ago, a poll came out showing that for the first time ever, a majority of Democrats favor the Palestinians, just over 50%. Now, I remember 20 and 30 years ago when the polls were 85 and then mm. they deteriorated from our point of view, they were 60-15. This poll should have shaken the pillars of Israel's national security establishment and yeah. the political establishment. But it doesn't. That's, but it doesn't. Yeah. The Jewish community, as the mayor was talking about correctly, votes something like 80% democratic. We have a convergence here. Among young people, it's even worse because we now have generations of Americans who've grown up on a different narrative of Israel, not the horrific early, it's her- mm. heroic early heroic. years, uh, not uh, the, the post-Holocaust era, not 67, yeah. but a horrific image of Israel as a brutal occupier. Occupy. Add to this, there are some fundamental changes in American demography totally unrelated to Israel. The rise of certain, the, the most rapidly growing population groups in Israel, in the United States, mm-hmm. has nothing to do with Israel, but they aren't affiliated with Israel. So that there are reasons to worry about a long-term deterioration in the relationship in any event. Then you add to it the, what's happened with the Palestinian issue, it's been with us a source of, uh, of controversy, dis- disagreement with the U.S. for decades. It reached a crisis point already. I mean, you can poison a well, so to speak, for so long, and for at least the Democratic left, and I'm not talking about the squad, uh, forget them, for the Democratic left as a whole, we reached that turning point. Mm-hmm. And for the first time in the 2020 elections, we had three Democratic mm-hmm. candidates, Warren Sanders Buttigieg, talking about and what was until now was absolutely sacrosanct linking military aid to Israel to Israel's positions and, on the West yeah. Bank so we were heading for Ending a cri- the fiction so to say <laughs> we were heading for a crisis in any event and the fiction again nobody was buying it anymore so what should we do first of all for our own sake domestically we should put a stop to these so-called reform processes in terms of the relationship with the US and We should also be putting an end to it, or at least doing it on the basis of a true, broad consensus. And if, there's, if we can do, I'll conclude with this, there's mm-hmm. one thing that Israel can do to ensure the long-term vitality of the relationship with the U.S., despite differences over a lot of other issues, it's to at least create the impression that we are the side working tirelessly for, if not a peace agreement, at a bare minimum, progress with the Palestinians. Put the onus back on the Palestinian side, take it away from Israel. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Chuck. Lina. Wow, there's so many things to do, but uh, just maybe something about the Palestinian issue, because I, I think that the, maybe for the, the, the protesters, still the, the Palestinian issue is a non-issue. And I think there needs to be an understanding that it is part of the issue. This is part of the, the reason yeah. for these moves that this government is doing is in order to get full control forever and, In the Palesti- on the Palestinians making us eventually a one state with second rate uh, citizens or residents the Palestinians and that won't be a democracy anymore either okay that will be an apartheid state mm-hmm. so those that fighting for democracy should also think about that point and more what can be done now I said it before I will say it now I think that The public has to work on confidence building. Mm-hmm. There needs to be more discussions between each other, understand the red lines of each one of the sides. Also acknowledge that there are people that think differently, that think that the judicial the judges maybe interfere too much. It's not an illegitimate idea. Yeah. Just the tools and the way that they, these they may be potentially 
reforms that could be done. And the way is uh, clearly not a reform, but uh, as, as uh, was said, and uh, I recall what uh, Justice Levine said in the past, before he was a uh, minister, mm-hmm. uh, D9 on the court system. Um, and, that we, and that we have to stop because yeah. then we won't, we, are, we won't be a democracy. Thank you. Mayo. Well, first of all, I want to reiterate, it is the responsibility of the majority government in Israel to deal with the situation with open eyes. We are in a deep, brutal kind of a crisis that we have to end and to have to, we have to end it now. And the number one responsibility is on the shoulders of the government and the prime minister, number one. So the first thing they have to do is to stop this process, this crazy process <clears throat> in, in parliament, and they have to change course and to think and plan and act on the priorities that pre- presently arise, mostly because of the crisis that we are in. So we have to heal the wounds that we have domestically, and we have to restructure a new charter, mm-hmm. basic charter, that will be the basis for our future democracy. A constitution? I don't, it doesn't necessarily have to be a constitution. It has to be some kind of a charter that sets up the rules of the game that will be cherished by the uh, different parties and the different groups in the country. And we have to think about democracy first. This is the most important thing that we have to a liberal democracy first. on a, a real <laughs> democratic state. And we have a lot to do in this respect, a lot to do. So this is what has to be done right now. Starting today. Starting today, exactly. Chuck <laughs> Freilich. Nina Shorbit Baruch, Meir Elran, thank you very much for joining me today. It was a privilege to hear your opinions. And thank you very much for our listeners and viewers uh, that joined us today. And we are all looking forward to see what will happen next week. And thank you. Trying Adi to Kanto. keep optimism as much as we can. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Adi. Thank you.